Um, it is the last Sunday of the series called The Upside Down Kingdom. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity to share with you um, these words that Jesus uh, spoke so many years ago that concluded um, his message regarding the coming of the kingdom, the coming of the church, the coming of who we are. So uh, before I jump into that, though, would you pray with me um, as we spend time uh, looking uh, through God's word together? God, we do wait with great hope. God, it's so exciting that when Jesus was here, he spoke these words in anticipation of what your kingdom would be on earth. And now, God, we enter a time of season where we anticipate the coming of the Christ child. We are so grateful because this is how your love has manifested itself. We ask, God, that as we wait in anticipation, Lord, we would be people of hope. We would be people of promise. We would be people of love as we look to celebrate, Lord, the coming of the Christ child. We thank you and we pray this in your son's name. Amen. As we're coming to the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, it's crystal clear. He is explaining what's at stake for all of those who would stake their citizenship in his upside-down kingdom. It's about choice. It comes down to choice. And once again, Jesus is asking, what will you choose? There was a medical study from 2006 that reveals just how difficult change is for people. How many of you love change? You love Love to just live in a cycle of change. Just love it, right? Roughly, roughly 600,000 people have heart bypass surgery every year in our country. 600,000. And these people are told after their bypass surgery that they must change their lifestyle. They must change their diet because... A bypass is a temporary fix. They must change quicking and smoking because a bypass is a temporary fix. They must exercise and reduce stress. Why? Because a bypass is a temporary fix. In essence, the doctors say this, change or die. You would think that a near-death experience would forever grab the attention of most patients, right? you would think they, they would vote for change. You would think that the argument for change is so compelling that the patients would make the appropriate lifestyle alterations. Sadly, that's not the case. 90% of heart patients do not change. They remain the same, living the status quo. Study after study indicates that after two years of, after two years of their heart surgery, the patients have not altered their behavior. Instead of making changes for life, they choose death. Change is that difficult. The majority of heart patients choose not to change. They act as if they would rather die. And here in Matthew's Gospel, as I shared a few weeks ago, everything comes down to choosing, making a choice. Jesus is offering all of humanity the opportunity to go a different way, to take a different path, to, to stay out a different road, a path that as we will find, while not free of difficulty and trial, it is still a way that leads to life. Here's what I want you to take home today. Jesus concludes with Two ways of living for all of us to consider when thinking about his upside-down kingdom. It's a life that's anchored in the unshakable foundation or a life filled with the turmoil of instability and disaster after disaster after disaster. Jesus is unquestionably clear 
as he concludes the Sermon on the Mount. He tells his listeners then, and he tells us today, that we must have a firm foundation. Read along with me, if you will. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You guys remember the song? The wise man built his house upon the rock, right? And the rains came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. In the passage we looked at last week, Matthew 7, 15 to 23, there's kind of this clear delineation Jesus leans into as he describes the difference between uh, those who are true followers, true disciples, and those who are false followers. It's the difference between intellectually kind of making this affirmation of God's word and actually putting into practice the words of Jesus, that is being a people who are actually doing the words of Jesus. Dallas Willard says this, life in the kingdom is not just a matter of not doing what is wrong. Get that? Life in the kingdom, it's not a matter of not just doing what is wrong. Apprentices of Jesus are primarily occupied with the positive good that can be done during their days under the sun. What they and God get out of their lifetime is chiefly the person they become. And that is why their real life is so, so important. John Stott was a Bible teacher, an English Bible teacher, and he said this, what Jesus is stressing is that those who truly hear the gospel and profess faith will always obey him, expressing their faith in their works. The instability of a home, it would have been very familiar to Jesus' audience in that day. Because the homes in the region where Jesus lived, they were very familiar with this concept of a house without a foundation. The houses in Palestine were completely dependent, completely dependent on the ground they had been built on being stable. One of the boroughs in my hometown of New York City um, is mentioned in this book called The Emotionally Healthy Leader by Pete Scazzaro. And he describes the island of Manhattan. And it consists um, almost, the island of Manhattan consists almost entirely of bare granite. And it's a very hard and strong type of rock. Now, to carry the weight of a 75 or 100-story skyscraper, Builders use a foundation anchor that's called a pile. Have you ever heard of this? They call them piles. And piles are concrete or steel columns that are hammered into the ground until they hit solid rock. For especially tall buildings, some of the piles that are driven into the ground, do you know they will drive those up to 25 stories deep into the ground? And the heavy weight of the, the skyscraper is kind of then distributed through all of those piles. They support the, the structure's enormous, enormous weight. If the foundation piles are drilled and driven in poorly, cracks will eventually appear in the structure. Entire buildings may lean. They must then be torn down or they'll lift the building so that the piles can be reset and that's costly it costs a lot of money time and in the same way unless the structural supports were deeply drilled into the granite of our soul the above the surface levels of your life your leadership in this case of this book how you live your life it will remain vulnerable we all need a deep foundation. And Jesus is telling, he's telling all would-be citizens of the upside-down kingdom that unless we dig deep and establish deeply rooted connection with him, the rock in this, in this passage, we cannot, we will not stand. So Jesus gives us this very clear picture 
of the disaster that awaits with dangerously less than solid foundation. But then, Jesus, just to make sure <laughs> that his listeners are paying attention and that they are absolutely clear on what's at stake, Jesus describes a spiritual peril. And the spiritual peril is what happens when you have a flimsy foundation. We can pick it up uh, in the same passage in verse 26, where Jesus says, But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like the foolish man. You remember the song? The foolish man built his house upon the sand, right? It's like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. You know, in our culture, we have quite a number of things that many believe constitute a good life, right? We have uh, wealth. People think if you're wealthy. A physical appearance, the way that we, way that we look. Power and influence, right? If you have the right zip code, yeah, you live in the right place. The most popular course in the history of Yale University was offered in the fall of 2017. Psych 157, Psychology and the Good Life. Nearly, get this, nearly one-fourth of Yale undergraduates registered for that class. Lori Santos is a psychology professor who teaches the course. She says that she tries to teach students how to lead a happier, more satisfying life. And it's no wonder that the course caught on. There was a study that was done back in 2013 by the Yale uh, College Council, and it found that more than half of the undergraduates sought mental health care from the university while enrolled. And one of Santos' principal's lessons is that the things Yale undergraduates most associate with achieving happiness, a high grade, prestigious internship, a good paying job, do not increase happiness at all. Scientists didn't realize this in the same way um, 10 or so years ago, Professor Santos says. Our institutions about our intuitions, I'm sorry, our intuitions about what will make us happy, like winning the lottery, getting a good grade, are totally wrong. But Jesus is telling us that the bottom line is this. We've got two options. Be his disciple or not. Build on the rock or build on sand. That's pretty stark. That's it. And because of that, we must make a choice. And if we choose to be his disciple, it means engaging in a daily, ongoing, ever-changing, and growing relationship with Jesus. And for those who mistakenly believe that following Jesus or discipleship is not to be seriously pursued, when difficulties and hard times come, and they will. When the rain and the streams or floods and winds come, and they will. It will make a mess of your life. Your life will become a mess, even in times when you're following Jesus. Just like the students at Yale, pursuing all the wrong things, believing that uh, we have to be happy or fulfilled with stuff. The truth is that when the rains come down and the stream or the floods come up, the winds blow, if you have a, film, if you have a flimsy foundation, it means that your life will be completely devastated. In light of Jesus' warning about a flimsy foundation, a foundation made of sand, I want you to answer this following question. Just answer it in your head. Okay? You don't have to talk out loud to the person sitting next to you. You can if, like, you're friends, you know, or you're married, you want to. But, you know, this is one of those self-revealing things. So, all right? But here is a question 
that I want you to answer right where you're sitting. It comes from a great book called Hold Life Transformation by a pastor named Keith Meyer. He asked this question, if you were to list all the stuff in your life, not just the material things, but your whole being, spiritual, relational, and emotional, and sort it into two piles, one that Christ and you rule over, and one that's ruled over by sin in the world, what would be in each pile? What, who, who, who would be the king of your stuff? When we talk about life in the kingdom, or the upside-down kingdom, we are talking about placing all of our stuff under the rule of God. So, friends, when you ask yourselves the following questions, answer truthfully. It'll, it'll reveal precisely what your foundation is made of. Here's the first question. I want you to think about this. Who, who am I becoming? Who am I becoming? What are the regular habits that I've given myself to? What are my regular, regular habits? How about this? What relationships am I cultivating? Do they make me more like Jesus or not? What relationships am I cultivating? Where I become more like Jesus because I hang out with these people or no? What are my responses to life circumstances? Are those responses evidences of me becoming more like Jesus? Is this me building my life on the sand? What are my responses to life circumstances? Who is God calling me to become? Who's God calling me to become? What changes is God calling me to make in order to live into the life he wants for me? Ah, that's a hard one. What changes is God calling me to make so that I can live in the life that he wants me to? A few years ago, I realized that my own life, my life as a pastor, <clears throat> as a husband, as a father, as a follower of Jesus, was on incredibly shaky ground. I knew that my own life was not authentically reflecting the values that Jesus calls us to live out here in the Sermon on the Mount. And so, after some serious study and reading and prayer, I, I found a tool, I found a tool that I've continually used in order to ensure that my own life is built on a rock and not on sand. And I want to share it with you because I know for my life as a follower of Jesus, it has been and continues to be powerfully transformative. It's a tool, it's an ancient tool, it's called a rule of life. And here's what my rule of life looks like. And I've engaged this rule of life for the last decade or so. It's made a difference like nothing else has. And if you're anything like me, you found yourself overwhelmed with the voices that come to you in life from your family, from your friends, from coworkers, from neighbors, pastors. <laughs> and so several years ago, I decided that in order to be the kind of Jesus follower that God calls me to be, at the center of my life, which is what that center circle represents in the picture at the center of my life I needed to believe and accept the one singular responsibility that I must fulfill to be an authentic son of God one thing and that was to be holy and pleasing to God 
alone. Nothing else matters. Out of that, for me, comes the rest of my life. Now, some of this is dated, and I know that I have made a regular habit of updating my rule of life. These different quadrants that represent um, the, the way that I live my life, um, every few years have to be changed. But the one thing that never changes, the one rule that never changes, is the biblical truth that I'm called to be holy and pleasing to God alone. Folks, friends, this is what it means to live as upside-down kingdom citizens. Listening for, living for, listening to, leaning on, trusting in the foundation that unlike every other single thing around us changes, Jesus never does. That's what it means to be an upside-down kingdom citizen. As I conclude this series, let me, let me close this morning uh, with this. Have you ever seen a sinkhole? Anybody ever seen a sinkhole like in real life? You ever seen one? Yeah, you've seen them, right? The cars can be parked on the street day after day, right? And everything, it appears normal. Then one day, the asphalt caves in, cars disappear into a gigantic hole. And everybody says, that hole came out of nowhere. But they're wrong. They're wrong. The hole appears suddenly, but the process that has led to it has probably gone on for many, many years. The underground erosion was invisible, but it was inevitable. And that hole was going to be there. Sinkholes, they remind us of two things. First, something can look good on the outside. And underneath, major problems have been going on for years. And there's a disaster about to happen. Second, our lives are affected by little choices. Little choices over time which have cumulative effects that can result in either moral strength or disaster. Sinkholes. The wise man builds his house upon the rock. The wind blows. The river. The floods come up. And the house stands. And that's our prayer here at FFMC. That you are in fact doing what must be done so that your foundation is solid. Built on the immovable, unshakable foundation of Jesus Christ. That is the upside down kingdom. Let's pray. God, it is so good to know that when we arrange our priorities in a way that lines up with what you tell us in your word, you are faithful and you are just. Lord, you will sustain us, you will hold us and uphold us no matter what goes on around us. But God, we must make a choice. And God, that's not a choice we make once upon a time. Lord, the fact is, the truth is, the reality is, it is a choice that we make every single day and probably, Lord, that the truth be known every single moment of every day. And Lord, that's not to be um, a heavy load. That's not to meant to be punishing. No, God, actually it's freeing if we really think about it. It is such an incredible burden to hand over to you that you will manage the weight of this life for us and on behalf of us. Lord, may we be people 
who live in the joy that this upside down kingdom calls us to. We are so grateful for Jesus' message in this Sermon on the Mount. And we pray all of this in your Son's name. Amen.